You are listening to episode 32 of the R Podcast. everyone and welcome to episode 32 of the R podcast. My name is Eric Nance and I'm very happy that you've joined me for this episode. I am fresh off of what is another outstanding R studio conference and I have a lot of thoughts about that so much so that I'm splitting this kind of coverage of the conference into at least two episodes and perhaps even more. Um, I have a wonderful interview um, with our studio software engineer, Kevin Uche, in just a little bit. I want to lead off the show with some of my takes on what was arguably the biggest news story uh, coming out of the conference, specifically through one of the keynotes. So um, just to preface this, I had kind of heard a bit of chatter and rumors about a really big announcement that was coming during uh, this keynote um, by J.J. Allaire, who, of course, is the CEO of our studio. And I admit, I was trying to probe a little bit to certain people that I thought might know something. And I give them credit. They did not reveal anything to me. <laughs> the only thing they mentioned was that, Eric, I think you're going to like it. And I was going, I was trying to be reassured about that. But when you don't know something's happening or what is about to happen, Sometimes you just have to take a believe it when you see it approach, but I was cautiously optimistic. So you undoubtedly know the news by now, um, but during the keynote from J.J. O'Leary, and this was on the first official day of the conference, he announced <clears throat> that our studio had officially become a public benefit corporation or PBC. I'll be completely honest with you. I have never heard about this type of um, organization or designation before. Um, so I'm definitely been doing some reading on this, but, and we'll, we'll have a link to JJ's uh, blog post from our studio.com as well as the keynote slides where he kind of sets the story up. Um, this is really interesting because this, this item has been picked up by a lot of the other tech news sites out there. And it's been a while, from my recollection, even though I've been using R since a very long time, probably more than I care to admit, um, but I don't recall another event this in recent times that has led to this much kind of mainstream tech press. Even, even one of the Linux podcasts I listened to had a short uh, commentary on it. What's really interesting to me is seeing kind of JJ's vision for the company being revealed in different ways. And little fun fact, but JJ was a very early guest on this very podcast back when I was attending the what was called the Shiny DevCon. And he definitely talked a little bit about how that conference went, but I could kind of glean that JJ had big visions for the company. And it's so interesting to see where that's led to. Um, I'm going to want to make one other note before I get into how I interpret all this is that at the end of the keynote, well, first there was a huge round of applause after he made the big reveal, but after the, after the keynote officially wrapped up, it was an absolute standing ovation of over, gosh, we had over 2,400 attendees at this conference. And I believe most of them were in the room during this keynote. Um, this was certainly a very powerful moment um, to me personally, just to see a company take this leap of faith and perhaps it's not a leap of faith. I'm still getting to know what this all means, but in terms of contributing back to the community and putting their actions in front of their words, so to speak, of this approach, um, you could definitely sense I mean, JJ's a cool guy. I could kind of sense some emotion playing there when he was looking at the room. 
but it was definitely one of those moments I won't forget for a long time in terms of being involved with the art community. So I have been doing a bit of research on this uh, since I got back and during my layovers on the way back home. On I'll have a I'll have a link in the show notes to a nice summary article on the kind of more specific details of what constitutes a PBC. Now, of course, I'm going to put a disclaimer right up front. Now, I am definitely not a lawyer, and I definitely don't play one on the podcast. <laughs> but I will um, share some of my takeaways um, in hopes that maybe it spurs some conversation, perhaps after the show, if you want to get in touch with me. Now, uh, the, the becoming a PBC doesn't outright prevent another company from acquiring our studio, but it does offer what's kind of referred to as takeover protection. Uh, and one way that it kind of um, assures that is that if a corporation or a bigger company decides to acquire our studio, or even vice versa, that this kind of merged certificate of incorporation that has to occur when these companies come together, it needs to contain at least identical provisions in this certificate or charter, I'm not sure what the exact term is, that detail the public benefits. Otherwise, the transaction must receive at least two-thirds of the desired company's voting shares. So put that in perspective, if a larger company was going to buy our studio, that the, the shareholders and other constituents of our studio as part of this new you know, PBC corporation, at least two thirds of them would have to approve of the acquisition. So that is already, I think, a step in the right direction. Like I said, it doesn't completely prevent somebody from acquiring our studio, but at least it hopefully ensures that the vision is still met if that day ever comes. So take that for what it's worth. Um, so now what's nice is our studio has the legal freedom to consider how decisions impact the stakeholders besides the actual shareholders. Now, who those other stakeholders are, I'm still trying to figure that out, but it does seem like kind of a hybrid of the broader community, maybe some other members. Um, but it's, and the key point is it's not just about actual shareholders of the company. And that the company's board, like our studio, now has the right and, to be honest, duty to consider the public's good and social benefits or the risk for any of the key decisions they make. This is where I start to see the real benefits of a PBC. It's really trying to put in writing or putting in kind of the operational piece that a company's mission is not just to make money. Of course, let's not kid ourselves. Making money is a big part of it. But this is more about accounting, having accountability for what is being good in the broader public. In, our, in the case here, the broader R community, for example, or the broader data science community. Having open software for data science. That was, of course, his title for the keynote. But now this PBC designation is going to at least put kind of a, a nice structure in front of that that we can draw upon as hopefully seeing this vision come through. And in my research, I saw that it seems like there are a, a growing number of investors out there that are becoming more interested to put their investment in companies that are socially responsible, not just making a bunch of money for the bottom line. And some of them are called impact investors, and they seem to believe that the long-term value of a PBC is better than a typical for-profit corporation. So to me, what that means is that if there are other companies or other stakeholders that want to help with our studio, these are the people that hopefully agree with the vision that JJ and the company are now outlined for themselves. Now, I, I'm not sure if everything is going to work well. I mean, again, I'm still learning about this. One potential disadvantage I've seen mentioned is that it might be more difficult for some investors to be certain on how, if, like, for example, our studio became a public company in terms of you know, shares, how trade performance will go. And also, 
there has been, this is still, I mean, not totally new, but somewhat new effort. And some uncertainty exists in the legal precedents on how a PBC would balance competing interests potentially from the shareholders and the constituents. Again, this is all stuff I've been reading about, and I'm hoping to learn more as I go. Um, but going back to my perspective a bit, I've been following open source software for a long time. You know, as, as those listeners know, I've been very passionate about Linux and the value that brings to both myself and what I do from building things and learning technology. But it's interesting that as far as I can tell, none of the major vendors that are in a similar position as our studio have gone for PPC status. So our studio is really again, it appears anyway, leading in this front of being a forward-facing company in open source and data science, building tools to help us with that. Of course, wrapping the R ecosystem in integrations of other platforms too. Um, Certainly my hope is that it allows our studio to invest more resources in the kinds of initiatives that can position the value of their open source mentality to perhaps their customers that still don't quite get the value of, of what open source software brings. Um, I'm fortunate and I'm starting to relay that message loud and clear to um, people I work with that open source has enabled us to do so many awesome things that probably would not have been possible with just proprietary software. In fact, the uh, JJ's keynote mentions a few key pieces of proprietary software, one of which is still very much entrenched in my particular industry, but that hopefully this movement will bring open source more to the forefront than it already is. One thing I'm also curious about as we go forward is that if this event, this news will maybe alleviate some concerns about our studio's influence on the broader R community. If the broader community, for example, is going to be considered this first class, what I'll put in air quotes, public constituent that our studio may be, you know, you might say legally mandated to serve the community's best interest in addition to their stakeholders, their shareholders. Um, I know there has been always some concern about the influence of things like the tidyverse that I've seen mentioned in previous uh, some Twitter threads and maybe some conference Q&As. Um, I just hope that that this, this, this new designation is a way for JJ to kind of put a, put a wave, a flag, so to speak, saying, you know, we're here for open source. We're not here to suddenly turn our studio itself into a proprietary platform that we have to buy in even just to use the open source, what is now the open source version of it that they'll continue to work on these great, whether they're packages or other tooling around the R ecosystem, integrations with other systems, such as with database accesses, um, Python, integrating with Python, that all this is still going on. The awesome advancements in TensorFlow, lots of things like that. I hope this just means more of that is coming, that there aren't a lot of changes on that front um, but we'll also have links to the um, official report that our studio has put out as part of their process to become a PBC, where they even outline for each of the open source efforts, or most of them anyway, um, the balance of GitHub or Git commits for each of the things um, from their employees versus the community. And it's interesting to look at that data a bit. And like I said, I'm getting to know what this really means, just even a PBC in general. And I'm trying to find some cool kind of data around the existing PBCs. And maybe I'll do some nice analysis around that. So maybe in a future episode, once I get my hands on these things, I'll share that with all of you. So I'll have a lot more thoughts on the conference in general, um, probably throughout the next episode as well, um, because I was also wearing multiple hats, so to speak, where I presented a poster, I was helping with our studio community, and definitely learning a lot of cool things. So there's there's a lot to talk about. Um, the other thing I'll mention before we get to our interview is that I had the great pleasure of meeting with 
get this, three other curators for the awesome R Weekly service. Um, you've hopefully heard me mention R Weekly before on the on the show, but I take great pride in being one of the week the rotating curators for R Weekly, where we assemble the the best stories around the R community, novel uses of R for data science, great tutorials, new packages coming out, new updates to packages, um, key events that are happening. We have a whole bunch of categories, and this was awesome where I was able to meet, like I said, three of the other curators. Um, Colin Fay, who I met actually last year at our studio conf. He is, of course, the author of Golem. Awesome guy. And he was on one of my Shining Developer Series episodes, a really great session there. Um, fun fact, I was able to have dinner with him and his uh, his colleague, uh, Christoph Devra. And I know I'm not pronouncing it right. Sorry, Christoph. Um, we had dinner multiple times. And luckily, they never got sick of me. <laughs> I was always happy to talk with them. They're, they're great people at ThinkR. I, I like them a lot. This was also the first time I met Jonathan Carroll in person. We've known each other virtually for years. And in fact, he was one of the very first listeners of this very podcast. So we had a lot of fun talking about the trends we're seeing in the R community and some things we're seeing from kind of the R core side of things and sharing stories of our shiny developments because... It's cool to learn that he and I are actually working in the same industry. That was really neat. And I also met for the first time Rio Nakagarara. And hopefully I got that right, Rio. Um, He came all the way from Japan. He's published some really cool and insightful analyses of football data. Now I'm talking about the world's definition of football, not the United States definition of football. And he's also a a hockey fan just like me. So we had lots of fun talking about that. So you may have seen a, a post on Twitter. We actually had a cool photo that Colin took of the four of us together. And that was that was fun to, to be a part of that. Um, so just by coincidence, I was a curator this past week. And there's a bunch of awesome links about our studio comp and the latest issue. And we all, I also want to take this opportunity to have a kind of a call to action, so to speak. Um, we've had a little bit of turnover in our, our, our curator group, and we would more than welcome those that are passionate about finding these great stories and sharing them with others to join our, our weekly team. Um, visit rweekly.org. There are links there to get in touch with us um, on the About page. Um, we're also on GitHub, of course. Um, you can find uh, ways to get in touch with us there. But we are definitely looking for more curators to join us. Because we have a lot of ideas, like Jonathan and I were talking about this, to make new advancements with some automations that are possible to alleviate some of the manual efforts. We can't eliminate everything, and that's we do take great pride in us, the curator side, being a great lens to assemble all this together and, and agreeing as a group on these things. But again, we could certainly use help to, to see this vision through. So if you're interested... Now, please get in touch. We greatly appreciate it. So I, I've, I've definitely rambled a bit long enough. I want to now share my awesome interview with one of our studio's uh, original software engineers and all-around all great guy, uh, Kevin Uche. So I hope you enjoy listening. everybody we are on the last day of our studio conf another jam-packed event and i have the pleasure of talking on the very talented our studio engineers who is responsible for so many of the great tools that we use we're going to talk about a couple of them here but it's my pleasure to introduce to the art podcast kevin Uche. kevin thank you for joining me <laughs> thank you so um, why don't you tell our listeners that aren't familiar with you a bit about your background and how you got started with R and how you wound up at our studio. All right. Well, this is a bit of a long story, but I think it's a good one. So I work as a software engineer at our studio on the IDE team, but my background is not in software. It's actually in statistics and R. Like I, oh, interesting. I, yeah, yeah. I, gr- I grew up in the R world. Mm-hmm. So I even remember like, when I was first taking computer science classes in university in like 2005, I remember, you know, these Java classes and I was just, it was not exciting for me back then. Like I looked at programming, like 
is this something I want to do? It doesn't feel like it. I mean, I love math, you know. And then it wasn't until I started taking my first statistics classes, and that's where I got exposed to R at UBC, mm -hmm. where I, you know, I started writing some R codes, like, hey, you can actually do cool stuff with a programming language. It doesn't have yeah. to feel so painful. Nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> first got exposed to R at UBC, and that's where I got excited. I ended up doing my bachelor's in statistics. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to UBC again to do my master's. And it was there where I had the great fortune of meeting Jenny Bryan. Oh, wonderful. But yeah, so she was an instructor at UBC at the time. Nice. And it was her uh, very famous STAT 545 class where I learned that I learned I really wanted to work with R like as a career. That's where I really started to fall in love with the language and uh -huh. using it to do things. Cool. Yeah. I also had the fortune of working with her on my master's thesis, so... Oh, nice. She became my advisor while I was there. Mm -hmm. And even back then, you know, Jenny had this very structured workflow where an analysis would be split into, you know, multiple scripts. You'd have your first script that reads the raw data in, cleans it up. You'd have your next script that uh, does the analysis. You have your next one that makes the figures and, you know, this very principled approach to like a software engineering kind of approach to data analysis and like... Mm -hmm. This is before tools like R Markdown or, you know, Packrat, let's say, mm -hmm. were around. But it was still that something, it wasn't just about getting the work done. It was getting it done right. Yeah. And what it meant to do an analysis right. Sure, sure. It was also around this time when the first versions of R Studio were becoming available. And I became a very early evangelist of R Studio among my classmates and colleagues. Likewise, yep. <laughs> I was right in there in the beginning, yep. Yeah. So, I promise we're getting to our studio soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, after graduation, I later joined uh, Raphael Gotardo's group at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in oh, Seattle. okay. And so, there, I was basically kind of like an internal R consultant, where I helped members of the group take some of the uh, novel research that they were making and turn it into R packages. Mm -hmm. And those R packages, working at the... FHCRC, you know, the birthplace of Bioconductor, the yes. packages we end up on Bioconductor. Yes, yes. And so I'm proud to say one of the packages I worked on there, Compass, uh, which I worked on together with a, um, a postdoc at the time, Lynn Lynn. She's now, um, I believe, a uh, assistant professor at Penn State. And I'm happy to say, like, that package was a big success. And I had a part in taking, you know, uh, colleagues work and making it accessible to a wider audience so you know it's her work it's her awesome research but I was able to do some work to make sure that other people in the art community would have had mm -hmm. access to it mm -hmm. and for me that was very rewarding very cool yeah and so there finally I'm at FHCRC I'm starting to feel more like a programmer and you know if mm -hmm. you're if you're a data analysis writing R code, you probably don't feel like a real programmer at first. Even though you are, you just feel like, oh, but real programmers do something else. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but it was kind of there where I started thinking about branching up to new programming language. And so the first thing I wanted to do is I said, okay, I want to learn C++. And my Trojan horse for doing that was RCPP. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And so I basically started learning C++ by uh, writing some simple extensions using C++ in the packages we were writing. Mm -hmm. And then later going back to RCPP itself and trying to contribute my own like bug fixes and feature requests and things like that. And so I was, it was actually through my contributions to RCPP where I was finally first noticed by JJ. Oh, so, nice. So JJ is a member of the RCPP team, he helps maintain and develop it. Yeah. And he saw some of the work I was doing and he he basically decided to take a huge chance and say, hey, this guy seems smart and driven. Maybe maybe we should give him a shot on the R Studio team. Wow. <laughs> and so like I've been at R Studio since 2014, so almost six years now. But in hindsight, I think he made a pretty big bet on me. You know, this is like <laughs> At the time, I was kind of like some R guy who was 
interested in software engineering and just starting to get the hang of it. And he yeah. said, you know, I, I want you to join the team. And I'm glad he did because I think it paid off for all of us. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm enamored by that story. This is why I love connecting with people like you is because we think you, I mean, we would think you've had like so much training in computer science with what the awesome stuff you do, which we'll get to. But you come from backgrounds like us, you know, yeah. classically trained statistician, yeah. cutting your teeth on real data analytics, and oh, that's just that's awesome. Yeah, I did not know that before, so I love having my, my having new surprises to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I love what I do so much. It's yeah, like, I like being the guy who can help people who have you know a vision that they want to implement in R, and what right. I can do as a tool builder to make that easy. That's incredibly rewarding for me yeah so yeah now now we'll touch on you know you've been you know, very hands-on with of course the R studio ide and it mm -hmm. is so capable of so many awesome things and to us that are using it from from the user perspective i know people like me are curious mm -hmm. you know what are some of the the features that you're most proud of that you've been able to implement <laughs> and some of the things that have been the most challenging to you as a developer of the, of the package so the one I'm most proud of, it might actually be one of my first ones, and that was the improvements to the R autocompletion engine. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so basically when I joined RStudio, I, if you've ever used like an old version of RStudio, say like 0 0.98 back in the old days, mm -hmm. you know, you got autocompletion results, but if you ever tried to have your arguments on a separate line from where you def give the function name, you just get nothing. And <laughs> I admit that drove me nuts in those days, yes. <laughs> so you can say I joined our studio because I needed to change that because it drove me just as nuts. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like uh, solving your own problem, right? Yeah. Helps benefit others. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm proud of that really for two reasons. One, because it was my first real mm -hmm. software engineering project and it required me to, you know, learn a lot to make that happen mm -hmm. and two because it was you know it's one of those things that it improves everyone's productivity like it shaves off seconds and from you know everyone's workflow it shaves off some of the cognitive energy that you have to spend on like i don't know remembering the exact capitalization of your function names which you know can be a pain in r sometimes exactly you know, yeah is it Rho means? Rho with a capital M means? Rho <laughs> dot right. means? Right. <laughs> let, let the completion engine tell you. <laughs> yep. It's, a, it's such a go-to feature for me, so I'm so <laughs> glad you're able to work on that so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so why it was rewarding, I had just joined our studio. I had some basic C++ chops, and now I was building a feature that required a combination of JavaScript, Java, C++, and R to all work together. The, the short version being... R Studio has a front end and a back end. The back end is C++ and R. The front mm -hmm. end is Java and JavaScript. And mm -hmm. so to put that whole feature together, top to bottom, I mean, I had to learn all these four things. Wow. And so it was just sort of through a sort of sheer force of will that I was able to learn enough to put the feature together. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, I look back at some of that code and I feel like, an experienced software engineer might recoil in horror at some of the parts of the code. But uh, we all have that. <laughs> <laughs> but it works and it solves yeah. a hard problem. Yep. I mean, it, it requires you to be cognizant of the UI experience. Like, how sure. is this actually going to feel in the user's hands? And, yep. it's, you know, it's little things like how long until the pop-up comes up? Um, am I actually showing completions that are relevant to the user? Is, if I'm filtering completions as they type, am I giving them a good filter if they're relevant completions? Right, right. But I think ultimately, though, that project taught me that for these kinds of projects, you sort of have these mental walls that make you feel like a problem might be intractable. And that's, you know, this was a big project for me as my first you know, real software engineering project at our studio. But right, right. The, the truth is, is if you can be persistent and patient and you just keep digging away at it and you can get through that wall and you, you kind of realize that, you know, you can, you can do it. You just have to work at it and work hard. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's great that perseverance paid <laughs> yes. off for sure. <laughs> yep. Yep. And so you've, 
you know, the other major thing that I know you well for is the idea of uh, dependency management and managing <laughs> environments. And you have been on a heck of a journey of building what first was Pack Rat and yes. now the next generation of RM. Yeah. And we'll definitely have a link to the recording of the talking dead once that's released. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear your take on that kind of journey that you've been through, <laughs> some of the technical challenges in this kind of domain and what about, you know, what's the rest of the experience been like and the learning you've had going from the development of Pack Rat to now RM. I'd love right. to hear about that. So I would say one of the interesting things is that, purely speaking, the technical issues are not that hard. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's you have a, a library of packages that you have installed. Those things have description files, and those description files tell you, you know, the package name, the version, and where you get those packages from. If you're right. installing packages using dev tools or remote, it's going to tell you, you know, if you got it from GitHub, what Git repository, what Git user, what's the SHA of the, uh, the commit hash. Mm -hmm. and so using that information, you know how to recover the package if you need to. Yeah. And so ultimately, like, creating a lock file means reading all the packages you have installed, taking the relevant parts of the description and putting into that lock file. Yep. And then similarly, going if you want to take the lock file and install packages in your project, you just have to recover the package sources and then R command install to install them. So what becomes really more challenging is sort of the prescribing a workflow that generally works because people have very different ideas on what the right way to manage your package dependencies is. Sure. If that makes sense. Sure. And so one thing we did in Packrat that I think kind of kneecapped us is, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, we overvalued reproducibility over user friendliness. And so as an example, by default with Packrat, whenever you call Packrat init, it's going to go out and download every single source tarball and put that into your Packrat source folder. Yes. Under yes. this assumption that, you know, maybe you won't have access to CRAN or something. And right. You can try to install those uh, packages from source, from your local source. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, you know, we have CRAN, we have the CRAN archive, we have internet access, and even if you don't, you can still solve that by creating your own, you know, managed internal package repository. And so right. solving that at the Packrat level, in hindsight, felt like the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. And so that's why You've seen in RStudio, we're doing work on the RStudio package manager, for example. Sure, or, yeah, yeah. Or in the open source world, there's like um, mini CRAN and things like that for building your own local right. package repositories. Right, right. Yeah, and then beyond that, so I was not the original developer of Packrat, which I'm not trying to lay blame or anything, <laughs> but it was um, Joe and Jonathan's work at first. And, you know, Jonathan is an incredible software engineer, but this was his first time using R, and he wasn't familiar with the ways that you, like, write idiomatic R code. I see. And so, okay. at least for me, some parts of maintaining Packrat became more difficult, and it became more difficult to change things because of some of the early decisions. And that's also why RN is not, um, like... It's a new package. It's not just we took Packrat and refactored everything. Ah, I see. That was one of the questions that some people had after your talk. But that, yeah. after hearing that context, it makes a lot more <laughs> sense. Yeah. Yeah. If we could, you know, we would. But mm -hmm. uh, for one, you know, people are using Packrat successfully and they're already, you know, there's all these scripts out there. We do not want to risk breaking any of those. Sure. And also, at least for uh, beginners, it's much more difficult to be successful with Packrat and right. part of it was kind of uh, how do you say turn over a fresh leaf with RM so that yep. we could get away from a bit of some of the there there are just sometimes you need to have a fresh you know fresh beginning and yeah I no I've been full disclosure I've been using Packrat since day one as well <laughs> because in the context of developing shiny apps I want to make sure that I contain that environment of the, what package versions we're using. Mm -hmm. that. So when I deploy, I have no surprises if we upgrade to a new version of R at the day job and I can be 
rest assured. Mm -hmm. But yes, the workflow could have been a bit better. Um, <laughs> I appreciate your honesty about that too. <laughs> I am so relieved that RM is trying to right a lot of those wrongs. Yeah. So obviously RM just had a crane release a little recently. Um, yeah. What are some of your plans kind of going forward? What are the things in RM that you still want to shore up in, 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 the, in the year and beyond? Uh, so right now, I think RM is in a pretty good place. Like it's okay. ready to use in your uh, projects. But mm -hmm. what I really want to get is feedback from users to find out uh, what's missing or what I can improve. Sure. And I've, uh, there's a lot of uh, early adopters of RM, which I'm delighted oh. to see. Yes. I was definitely one of those, yes, and I'm and thank, through the paces. <laughs> yes, and thank you for that. Oh, uh, my pleasure, because <laughs> like I said, this is one of those things that maybe some data scientists don't think about, but for me, yeah. this is very critical to my workflow, and I'm so happy that we yeah. had had this next generation <laughs> available to us, and you were very responsive <laughs> of all the issues that came about. So yeah. this kind of leads me to a point that just because to, you know, the engineers like you at our studio make a package, you welcome contributions from mm. all of us. And yeah. a, you've def you've always been very, like I said, responsive on taking those. So yeah. I hope the message gets clear that if you're using RM and there's anything wrong, then your opinion, please file an issue yes. and get in touch with yes, me, right? Yes, please. Cool, cool. So it's interesting, you know, before this talk, before I talk with you today, mm -hmm. I, like I said, I always thought you had like a computer science background. <laughs> you sure fooled me in a sense. Um, but even with your training in statistics, you know, what is it about R itself that you think is kind of the most surprising thing as a language that now that you've gone into this more of a development side of thing, a tool builder? What are the things that have been surprising you and how have you been able to navigate that? So in the language itself, I think now we're... Uh, non-standard evaluation is uh, most R users are familiar with that now, especially in dplyr. Right. And you know, as an R user, I was surprised to find out that that's you know not a thing in most other programming. Yeah, language. right. It's like, what do you mean I can't compute on the language? <laughs> <laughs> and then just like how easy it is to go from nothing to something in R. Like, if you want to make a plot, if you want to make something real, you you open R and you call the plot function. That's all you have to do. You don't you don't worry about you know package dependencies. You don't worry about compilers. You don't worry about all the other boilerplate stuff that happens right. when you're using other programming languages. It's just so easy to get started. Right. I right. think that's incredibly valuable. Yeah, well, I appreciate hearing that perspective because it's one of those things that even to me as an experienced R user, competing on the language didn't really click with me. But now with obviously advances and things like tidy evaluation, it's even in the context of Shiny as well, it's really opening my doors of doing really complex workflows and making things more reproducible. Yeah. But it is kind of mind blowing to those that maybe come from like a, a background of C or other mm -hmm. languages that this right. is even possible. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the other thing that I think needs to be said is the R community. I mean, Absolutely. we always say it, but it's true. The R community is amazing. It's the most you know fantastic group of programmers, researchers, academics you'll ever find. And so. The thing that I love about the R community is it's just full of people who want to work together and build yeah. cool things, you know? Yep. And there's there's <laughs> no, like, we all want to learn from each other. There's no secrets that we're trying to yeah. keep. And I'm in an industry where we're trying to be more open with things, but yeah. it's great to network with others. And I mean, I come from life sciences, but like you said, all across the different domains. We're all yeah. trying to build cool things or make interesting insights, and it's all... This conference always just hits home with me, even yeah. though it gets bigger and bigger. That sense of community has not gone away, yeah, and I'm yeah. really impressed by that. Yeah, and I'm I'm always so proud to know that I can be part of you know fostering that community. Even my role is you know as a tool builder at our yeah. studio, and 
you know, however small or big that role is in everyone's projects, I'm glad that I've been able to like make my mark and have my place. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I certainly appreciate you <laughs> sitting down with me to give me some inside knowledge on your <laughs> background and now you've been developing these awesome features. Um, for the listeners that want to come in and get in touch with you, follow what you're up to, what are the best ways they can, they can reach you? Uh, so if they want to get in touch with the R Studio team, the best place is community.rstudio.com mm-hmm. uh, if you're interested in what I'm doing or saying specifically you can follow me on Twitter at Kevin underscore Yushe. great yeah, and right. also follow me on GitHub if you want to see either my work on our studio or my uh, my own repositories if I <laughs> find the time to work on those two yeah <laughs> I know the feeling <laughs> well, we'll have all those links in the show notes but Kevin I know we've We've been able to talk shop about a lot of things over the years, but it's great to get you on the mic this time. And thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. All right, everybody. We'll be back right after this. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And I do apologize for the audio quality. Um, We were actually near kind of this area where they had the like the vendors that were sponsors and kind of like the the art studio lounge and the community area. And as we were recording this, they were tearing all that down because this was right after the last keynote. So you'll hear like banging of chairs and tables and stuff. I did I did the best I could with editing, but sometimes you couldn't. I tried my best to find a quiet area, but we just kind of had to find somewhere. So hopefully it, it came out OK. But again, my sincere thanks to Kevin for joining me on, on that interview. I learned a lot from him. And he's actually when he did his presentation at the conference about RMV, he wasn't even able to get through all of it. So I'll have links in the show notes to his presentation. Um, it definitely talks more about RM than what we even touched on in the interview. Um, one little fun fact is that when RM was first released to CRAN, I was super excited. As you heard, I was an early adopter of it. And I sent a tweet kind of congratulating Kevin and our studio on that release. And um, there was an awesome uh, community member that I met multiple times, uh, Emily Reeder um, thought that was a tease for interviewing Kevin at that time. Well, Emily, I paid that for her now at least, so you've heard it now. <laughs> but again, I had a great time talking with him. Um, so we'll wrap this up in a bit. I have a couple items I want to share with you before we close up shop here. The first is, is that I've started a kind of a new experiment, so to speak with uh, sharing some of my thoughts about R, data science, Linux, just life in general. And it's kind of like my version of an audio blog, you might say. And it's called Residual Snippets. And credit to uh, Curtis Kephart at our studio for helping me uh, think about a way to frame that effort. And maybe it's not the best name in the world. Who knows? But I want some kind of kind of statistics and kind of short it's really, and again, this thing is meant to be kind of completely informal. I'm going off the cuff, so to speak. There's no script in front of me. But the best part is, is that I can record the content of these straight from my cell phone with a little mic hooked up to it. And via some magic of the Telegram Messenger and Amazon Web Services, be able to publish those automatically when I hit send. So it's been a great learning opportunity to learn about these things like API interactions, AWS, even some Python is thrown in this as well. Um, But the other cool thing is that I put a little Shiny app in front of this and it's using the Shiny mobile package that was recently released on CRAN by David Grangen of the R Interface Project. It also incorporates a cool package that was actually presented at a lightning talk um, at the conference called Wave Surfer by Athos Petridamia. Hopefully I pronounced that right, Athos. Um, He, brilliant guy. Um, It was great to see his motivations for creating it. And he said he's looking for help from the shiny side of things. And I am more than happy to help out with that. Um, 
I also want to give a shout out to Mael Salmon, who's also one of our fellow Art Weekly curators and awesome our community member. She wrote an excellent post on using what's called the utterances widget so that instead of using um, third party slash, per, well, I should say proprietary, well, maybe that's not the right word, um, um, the service called Discus um, that people often use. In fact, I use it for my blog, my podcast site right now. But what's cool about the utterances widget is that you can directly incorporate GitHub issues into a web page. So it even works with shiny apps. So if you have feedback on residual snippets, it's easy just to go to the app itself, where we'll have a link in the show notes of this episode. And if you have comments on what I talk about, please just file an issue through the app itself. And by some strange miracle slash happy circumstance, <clears throat> through this kind of automation pipeline, I was able to create kind of a podcast-friendly RSS feed. And yes, it has been accepted on Apple Podcasts, which I find hilarious, um, but it's there. So if you want to listen on Apple Podcasts, um, you don't have to use my app for it. I completely understand because when I made this app, I am most definitely not trying to replace things like Pocket Cast or Apple Podcasts or Overcast. You throw all the podcast um, apps out there. I'm not in that business. I have a day job, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's a cool little experiment I have going on. And definitely if you have feedback, I'd much appreciate it. So yeah, one other thing I'll mention as kind of a, a call for awareness is that um, one of the community members who may or may not have attended the conference named Emo Wittfeldt. I'm sure I'm butchering that. I'm so sorry, Emo. Um, they've created a GitHub repository that collects links to all the slides, workshop materials, posters, and other online resources related to this year's Our Studio conference. So if you were one of the presenters at the conference, or you maybe you blogged about the conference, or you know of links to resources, please check the GitHub repo out. We'll have a link in the show notes. And you'll be able to simply do a PR to the Markdown document and add the links appropriately. So I've been submitting a few links as I've come across them, but it's always great to have everything curated in one, p in one place while we wait for the recordings to get posted on the RStudio site. So as I mentioned, this is the first of at least two episodes where I covered the RStudio Conf experience. In the next episode, I'll give a little teaser now, I will uh, share my experience, how I created and presented a poster about highlights in the Shiny community and some of the thoughts I have going forward. And plus, my guest for the next episode is an absolute wizard with integrating Shiny with frameworks like CSS and JavaScript. You won't want to miss it. It's a great conversation. Plus, I'll also share some of my other takeaways on the presentations I attended, as well as the workshop I attended, which was JavaScript for Shiny users, which was, again, I'll save more of that for the next episode, but that was a rocking good time, a great experience. So if you like what you've heard or if you have feedback you'd like to share, I accept it in many different ways. Um, if you want to go to the official site, r-podcast.org, there's a handy contact link where you can fill out the dedicated contact form. You're welcome to send me a tweet. I am at the rcast. And also, um, you can also email me directly at the rcast at gmail.com. And we also have a link to a comment form directly on this episode post, which would be r-podcast.org slash 32. So with that, we are going to wrap up episode 32 of the R Podcast. It's great to be talking with all of you again. So until next time. End of line. <laughs>